So we are entering Laodicea. All right, that's what's going on right now. Philadelphia is now being uh, left, and now we're entering the beginnings of Laodicea. We are going to look at Daniel chapter 11. For the Antichrist to take over the world, everything must be one world. Everything must be one world. That would include the currency, the currency. Now this could, uh, in verse 20, it could have a double application where it could apply to Jesus' timeline about the Roman Caesar, but it could also refer to tribulation context where the Antichrist himself will be taxing the whole world since the whole world is his domain. Daniel 11:20. Then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. But within few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Now, verse 21 is talking about the Antichrist, no doubt about it. He takes over the world, uses terms of peace and flattery, but he is, what the Bible says, a vile person. Now, notice it says, in his estate there shall stand, right? So, verse 20 this Antichrist is taking over this guy's role who's a raiser of taxes. Who's a raiser of taxes. Meaning that it is very possible that the Antichrist will take on the estate or take the position of taxing the whole world. Whatever the interpretation could be, the point is the Antichrist should be able to effectively have a one world currency. So we are entering the timeline where everything is becoming one world. There's no doubt about it. World War I and II truly paved the way for that one. It truly paved the way where everything becomes one world. And especially the currency. We're going to see that very soon. Before we cover the currency, however, I am going to uh, cover what happened after World War I. Now recall, fresh review, after World War I, uh, there's a lot of problems. The problem is that uh, the round table, which is otherwise known as the group, has used sinister means through bankers where they can have a play of, uh, they can put in their hands to the scenes and manipulate certain events where they can benefit something. Now, uh, like I've told you from uh, Anth uh, doc, uh, from Anthony Sutton's work, this is a guy who's a fellow researcher at Stanford's Hoover Institution, he mentioned that there's a, certain, uh, there's a certain method that elites use where they use chaos and from chaos there's a conflict and from conflict then they can uh, foresee the event and manipulate it. So that's the reason why world wars are important, and that's the reason why the events that happened after, between the world wars and after the world war, like the Treaty of Versailles, and then the League of Nations, and all this kind of stuff coming out, it's important that the elites put their hands to the scenes and be able to manipulate it. Now, like I showed you before, it's interesting that the round table didn't like the League of Nations, but nevertheless, that's why they set up CFR because they have to adapt so that they can still have control. Then you, uh, the Masons, which is very interestingly, they approved of the League of Nations, as I've showed you before. The Vatican, his, its hands is all over the group. I've already shown you that. The secret elites behind the scenes. And the secret elites behind the scenes, they've had Jesuit influence, if not Jesuits themselves, uh, within their organization. This goes all the way back to the Illuminati to Loyola and I've explained that last time. I've shown you that that's what's currently going on and World War II is happening. If World War II is happening, the elites are not done. As a matter of fact, they have never been done up to this day. Okay, so remember that. The elites have never been done up to this day. The most success that they've ever had was because of that timeline, starting when, coincidentally, when the people rejected that book, God rejected them and let the God of this world, through his own villains, take control of them. 
If you won't let the Word of God control your life, if you reject the Word of God, God will reject you, then who's going to own you? Yeah. yeah, the devil. Yeah. And the devil will use his minions to fulfill his purpose. And coincidentally, it was that timing of Westcott and Hort, like I've told you before. So the Vatican, they're not done, that means, okay? So what did they do to corrupt everything? In this chart, this is where we were at the beginning. Remember, independence, right? That was crucial in America, crucial for Baptist distinctive. So it was a separation of this church and state. That's why it's called independent. That's why we are Baptist, but we're called independent Baptist. Amen. We're called independent Baptist because we separate ourselves. So that uh, we, we separate the church and the state, one. Two, notice right here, it's states. Notice that? It's not all in one pot together. Nothing big or federal where it's able to overrun the states. But Abraham Lincoln, he uh, was responsible where it all fell to pieces, remember. So now United States became whole right here. So United States became whole with everything federal now. So little leaven, leaven at the whole lump, right? Why? Because the government has to protect the people, which sounds like a noble thing, but what men learn from history is that men never learn from history. Amen. One, you have, the, you have the brainwash mentality, the audacity to think that whoever you're going to give charge over your life, and God forbid your own soul one day, wow. is going to be a nice person, wow. and that it will last for a millennia. If there's one thing you know about human ne nature and even yourself, you have, the capa you have the capability to become evil, no matter how sincere you are. So that's what everyone messes up in. So then they're giving up more of their rights, relinquishing more of their independent power. It's becoming more federal. It became more federal after World War I. So we see right here the divided nations. These are the big players before World War I, right? The Holy Roman Empire right here, the Catholics, uh, they were siding with this one. They were in uh, controversy with France, Russia as well, and Britain. But now, look at this right here. USA just wants to be like Britain, and Britain wants to be like Europe. And we all want to be like each other. You notice that? Now, if I don't see round table conspiracy after that, especially looking at today, I don't know what that is. Because around the table, they have a, uh, remember, they were all about uh, the white man, uh, Britannia, uh, Anglo control. So this is fulfilling their purpose right here, which is very strange to me. But anyway, we all want to be like each other. I don't know why. Then we get Japan, Germany, Italy teaming up together, which is the Axis powers in World War II. You're going to see that. Russia, things are going so so bad over there that it's changing now. No longer the SARS. Now it's everybody has an equality, or so they thought. No, it's a new dictator due to the Bolshevik Revolution. So we start over here, and then I'm going to explain all the catastrophe that happened here. And then here is the Vatican's players, how they were able to put their hands into all these locations and events that occurred. So when communism took over uh, Russia, I believe that the Vatican, the Jesuits, were behind it. It's not a simple thing. When you had the Bolshevik Revolution, there were sinister hands behind it, bankers behind it, and the elites. The round table, their hands were behind the Bolshevik Revolution. And through the round table, you see Jesuits involved. Okay, so first things first, to establish this, I'm going to be reading The Godfathers from Chick Comics. And this is from uh, the... Uh, the Chick Comic Godfathers, page 12. All of this is based on Alberto Rivera. Alberto Rivera was supposedly a former Jesuit priest. Now I say supposedly because of what the public would think. The Catholic apologists, they hate Jack Chick, Alberto Rivera, they do whatever it takes to discredit them. Me, I actually believe, I won't say I believe 100%, but I believe a huge percentage of what they do is true. Because from my research with other stuff, that I looked at, it seemed to confirm more of Rivera's statement. As a matter of fact, uh, which is very strange, Avro Manhattan's work, it's very strange that the stuff that he wrote was confirmed by Rivera later on, and Rivera even told Jack Chick that Avro Manhattan's different 
testimony, so to speak, d different eyewitness testimony, uh, is seemed to, he found some similarities and confirmations with what he was told. Now, I'm going to be, uh, because I don't have time to go through documentations, I'll be honest with you, the, the devil's hand behind your history is endless with this one. I had to download a lot of stuff, read a lot of stuff, buy a lot of stuff, and this just makes your mind go la la land, all right? And I don't have time, all right? I got to read my Bible, okay? I'm not interested how the devil took over our world, all right? So um, I couldn't select quotes to uh, like last discipleship and explain it to you successfully. So I've came up with this idea. I'm going to simply read everything off of the Godfathers. That will be enough material. And uh, my basis though of evidence will not be Godfathers, okay? I'm going to simply say that 90% of the stuff what you hear from Godfathers, you'd be surprised is true. And then I'll give the works for you to look up at. Now they're the best, the number one work that I'd recommend for what you're going to hear from Godfathers is from uh, Edmund Paris's book, The Secret History of the Jesuits. This guy literally documents that even the critics don't know how to explain against him. Avro Manhattan, he's definitely very thorough. Dr. Upman's Church History of Catholic Conspiracies is based off of Avro Manhattan's work. However, Avro Manhattan, I guess because he's from the old times, he doesn't like uh, put every single footnote in a lot of the stuff that he says. He does give a lot of names. He talked to a lot of witnesses and he'll even name them and uh, he has credibility behind him uh, however uh, what I saw from one Catholic website not a lot of websites discredit Avro Manhattan but just one they'll say the only argument against him is just simply he doesn't document his work that's the only thing they'll say they don't disprove his arguments which I find very strange yeah. So they should be able to find contradictions. They should be able to disprove him easily. But all they say about it in Manhattan is he doesn't document much. So then that's why I'll recommend Edmund Paris's. Edmund Paris's book will blow everything out of the water. And this guy is a French, okay? This guy is from France. And he documents very thoroughly, it's crazy, about World War II and the things that were uh, from the beginning of Jesuit history. Very good. The number one book. Number one book if you want to prove that Jesuits were behind it. The second one is Avro Manhattan's book, and that would be the Vatican against world politics. So the stuff that I'm going to read to you about the Bolshevik Revolution will be found in his chapter about the Vatican against Russia. All right, it will be based on that. I might read some pages from there. So that's the Vatican against world politics. The best one is what Dr. Upman based his church history book on. It's called Vatican Ap Imperialism in the 20th Century. All right, Vatican Imperialism in the 20th Century. Out of print, all right? I couldn't find it. But Amazon still sells the old copies. I don't know who that person is, but that person still has those old copies, all right? It's almost 100 bucks. No, it's over 100 bucks, actually. All right, Avro Manhattan, I don't know how he does it. Most of his books are over 300 pages and he wrote 15 books almost just on the Vatican. No wonder they hate this guy and Dr. Upman put based 90% if not 99% of his material off of Avro Manhattan. It made a lot of sense. All right. So Manhattan really confirms the majority of Godfather. As a matter of fact, if you look at that book, you'll see Jack Chick's um, introduction over there and also the Godfather comic book showing. No, wow. Because it goes hand in hand oh. with that book, Vatican Against World Politics. Chick Publications used to sell a lot of his books, but it's out of print, so good luck, all right? Good luck. But those are the sources that you can base the most off on, all right? All right, here we go. And then I'll be sure to bring up the evidences. That way you can believe at least 90% what I'm going to say to you from this lesson, okay? Here we go. How was Russia taken over and became communist, right? So the elites were definitely behind it. In Russia, Tsar Nicholas, who was the protector of the Russian Orthodox Church and his wife, the Empress Alexandra, had a son named Alexis, who was the heir to the throne. Now remember the Vatican, why they launched World War I. Recall why. The Orthodox Church, remember that? 
because France rebelling uh, against the, uh, the new Holy Roman Empire now. So that's why uh, their enemy is still the Orthodox Church. If you read, uh, last thing I'll add, okay? If you read Vatica, uh, the Vatican, Moscow, and Washington Alliance by Avro Manhattan, it is insane. If you read that, it will open your eyes on why current United Nations always was in conflict with Russia. Okay, Vatican, because they're siding with the United Nations. Mm -hmm. All right, and spies from Russia go inside the Vatican and Washington, D.C., oh, wow. and then their spies go uh, to Russia as well. The, you know what that is? That is what the Bible showed you at Revelation 17, which is no surprise, elites all fighting against each other. All right. Okay, anyway, why? Everyone hungry for power. Nothing, nothing new from history, right? From the beginning of ancient times. That's what emperors and powerful rulers and elites have always done. Always fought, fight for power. You want to hear the term conspiracy? A lot of times mentioned is in the book of Kings. Elites killing off each other through conspiracies. Wow. All right? You don't learn about uh, biblical historic, uh, historical parts of human nature. All right. That was a nugget. Okay, let me go on. The little boy, so uh, Alex, uh, Alexis, their son, suffered from a disease. His blood, clot, uh, his blood wouldn't clot when he got a cut. If he fell when playing, the slightest bruise could cause internal bleeding. His mother's heart was breaking. The doctors couldn't help. The little boy suffered terribly. Rasputin, called the Mad Monk, was a man who had a strange gift of healing just like many priests of today who claim to have these powers. Rasputin had visions of God and the Virgin. When he came near the little boy, the bleeding stopped. Rasputin was involved in satanic sexual worship. He controlled the Empress. He had many enemies in high places. Many believe Rasputin was a demon-possessed monster who ruled Russia from behind the scenes. Even the Tsar was afraid of him and of his strange powers. Now most of this is based on Augustine Cardinal Bia of what he told Alberto Rivera. Augustine Cardinal Bia told us that in a weak moment, the Empress told Rasputin where the Tsar had hidden his gold. Rasputin passed this valuable information on to the Patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church just before Rasputin was assassinated. At Augustine Cardinal Bia's periodic briefings, he covered the past, present, and future goals on the Vatican's temporal power, earthly power. This was at the time when the Constitution was being updated as a result of the Vatican II Council. He says this, Cardinal Bia, in our long and careful preparation for the Russian Revo Revolution, Jesuits worked closely with Marx, Engels, Trotsky, Lenin, and Stalin. We secretly moved our gold into Russia through Germany using our key men. We believed that soon our enemy would be destroyed and communism would rise up as a new strong daughter of the Vatican. So originally why they supported the Bolshevik revolution, you must understand, is so that they can overthrow the Orthodox Church and replace it with Catholicism. So here is according to uh, the next parts right here. Lenin was in Switzerland when he heard news of the revolution starting in Russia. To help the revolution destroy their enemy, the German high command and others secretly prepared a special train to transport Lenin and his revolutionaries through Germany. In April 1917, Lenin and some of his key men made the trip in the famous SEAL train. Now remember Germany, they're, they lost World War I and they're suffering. Mm -hmm. So obviously they want vengeance against Russia. There are some, this is historical, okay, this is historical. There are people who believe that uh, Germany sent in the Bolshevik uh, revolutionaries into Russia and that's why it fell. 
Okay, that's beside the point. Here we go. The man most responsible for arranging this journey was Diego Bergen, a devout German Roman Catholic, trained in Jesuit schools, later to become the German ambassador to the Vatican during the Weimar Republic and Hitler's regime. If the revolution was successful, it would mean death to millions of people, including the Tsar and his family. By the time Lenin arrived in Russia in April of 1917, Lenin's competitors were controlling the revolution. The Tsar had been forced to abdicate. He and his family had been placed under house arrest. His government had collapsed, and most of his army had deserted him. Confusion was everywhere. The troops still loyal to the Tsar were called right uh, were called white Russians. The revolutionists were called reds. Yeah, you wonder why, that's why the communists liked reds, right? They were deadly enemies, fighting to survive. Lenin gained control of the revolutionary government and moved it to Moscow on March 10, 1918. In July, the royal family was moved to, I'm going to butcher names as usual, all right, Yekaterinburg in the Urals for security reasons. An army was moving towards the town where the family was staying. There was a chance they could be rescued. Okay, so they could be rescued. But what happened to the Tsar and his family? July 17, 1918, a group called the Ural Soviets. Others called them an unknown band of, uh, let's see right here, held a quick trial and found the royal family guilty. Dr. Rivera said, we were told some of them were Jesuits posing as communists. At last, the moment the Pope had waited for finally came. And then what happened was they got shot to pieces. The protector of the Orthodox Church, so remember the Tsar is a protector of the Orthodox Church. If he falls, what happens? Then the, Cap then the Catholics could get their hands on the Orthodox Church. Or uh, it's a communist right now, all right? So it's not... Uh, so, I'm going to show you a little bit more of Catholics. So according to Rivera, they were Catholics. The protector of the Orthodox Church was at long last facing the Jesuits of Rome, and without mercy, they blasted the poor, frightened little family into eternity. Later that night, the bodies were loaded into a truck, taken to a lonely mine called the Four Brothers. There, they were chopped up, burned, drenched with acid, and thrown down an abandoned mine shaft. The Jesuits had moved so fast, the Central Communist Party wasn't even aware of the the trial or the killing of the Tsar and his family until it was all over. It was a tremendous victory for the Vatican. We were told, Rivera says, or it's Cardinal B, I think, we were told that the hunt for the patriarchs, which is the religious leaders of the Orthodox Church, the priests, nuns, and monks of the Orthodox Church began in earnest. So here they come, and they're about to uh, wipe them out. Okay, then what happened? So what happened was this, actually. So then why did they survive? Why were they still ongoing? So Rivera claims this. Dr. Rivera said, we were told that when the Red Army was closing in to kill the old chief patriarch, all right, this is the guy in charge of the Orthodox Church, he greeted them with open arms and cried, Comrades, at last you've come. We have been waiting for you. We've been holding the Tsar's gold for you, my dear comrades. So he bought them, see? The communists were stunned at what he said. They put down their weapons and accepted the gold, mm -hmm. the patriarch's friendship, and ordered the killing of the Orthodox priests, nuns, and monks stopped immediately. The Orthodox Church was saved. Not only did the communists get the Tsar's gold, but they kept the Pope's gold too. The Pope's gold, which passed into Russia through Germany, was estimated to be worth, you wouldn't guess it, six, six, six million dollars. What the? <laughs> I know, six, six, six. What? When the Pope found out, he almost had a heart attack. He had been betrayed by his own communists. The Vatican went wild with anger. They had been double-crossed. The communists would pay for this crime no matter what it would cost. Okay, so all of these are according to Rivera's statements. Now, how much of, uh, so all of those specifics, I cannot say if it's true or false. I do believe in it personally, but I am going to establish now with these evidences, okay? 
one by one, and you're going to see a good number is true. Now, R.H. Bruce Lockhart, he is one of those people who had connections with the round table. So he wrote a book called British Agent, and this is how he described one incident, okay, when the Bolshevik Revolution occurred. Quote, another new acquaintance of these first days in uh, Bolshevik St. Petersburg was Raymond Robbins, the head of the American Red Cross mission. Although a rich man himself, he was an anti-capitalist. Hitherto, his two heroes had been Roosevelt and Cecil Rhodes. Now, Lenin had captured his imagination. Robbins was the only man whom Lenin was always willing to see, and whoever... Uh, succeeded in imposing his own personality on the unemotional Bolshevik leader. I returned from my interview to our flat only to find an urgent message from Robbins requesting me to come to see him at once. I found him in a state of great agitation. He had been in conflict with Sulkine, a nephew of Trotsky, and then assistant commissar for foreign affairs. Sulkine had been rude and the American who had a promise from Lenin that whatever happened, a train would always be ready for him at an hour's notice, was determined to exact an apology or to leave the country. When I arrived, he had just finished telephoning to Lenin. He had delivered his ultimatum and Lenin had promised to give a reply within 10 minutes. I waited while Robbins fumed. Then the telephone rang and Robbins picked up the receiver. Lenin, guess what? He yielded. Salkine was dismissed from his post. He was an old member of the party. Would Robbins have any objection if Lenin sent him as a Bolshevik emissary to burn? Robbins smiled grimly. Thank you, Mr. Lenin, he said, as I can send the bleep to hell. Burn is the next best thing you can do with him. How about that? So this is from uh, the round, uh, let's see right here. So notice right here that this is based off of Bruce Lockhart's account. This Bruce Lockhart, he was sent by Lord Milner. Remember, Milner is part of the round table. Notice how much, uh, this is strange stuff, isn't it? How they were able to have such power to make deals or to even control Lenin. So that's strange. So we see the round table involved. All right, now, here's a quote from Anthony Sutton himself, the guy who's a fellow researcher at Stanford, who wrote his book Skull and Bones. But uh, he also wrote a book called Black, uh, he also wrote a book called, let's see right here. No, this is not the, this is not the writing here. Let me find it. Not Anthony Sutton. It was... Here we go. Here we go. This is from the Executive uh, Intelligence Review Special Report of 1987. So I'm going to be reading that one. Now before I explain uh, this uh, report, Joseph Grace, for some of you who don't know, he is one of the elites and his connection, you want to guess, is Knights of Malta. Okay? That's all Catholic. This is all Catholic area. Joseph Grace was a very good Catholic. He was actually part of those uh, conspiracies, those bankers, who were controlling uh, the Bolshevik and funding the Bolshevik revolution behind the scenes. Now, uh, the evidence that Joseph Grace's Knights of Malta is found in... University of San Diego itself, their news releases, uh, 1977 of November the 3rd, biographical sketch of Joseph P. Grace. They admitted this. Grace was a member of the Knights of Malta, worldwide charitable organization. He was a found, yeah, worldwide charitable organization, yeah. He was a founder and for a number of years, president and chairman of the board of directors of the Catholic Youth Organization. Maintains clubhouses, recreational facilities for young people. The Catholic Boys Brigade awarded Grace the Star Pro Juventate. Grace was a trustee of the New York Catholic Protectory. Member of, if you know this name, he's a big name that was uh, important during politics and Catholicism. He was a member of Cardinal Spellman's Committee of the Laity and Director of St. Vincent's Hospital. He was a founder and director 
of the Casita Maria, a recreational and cultural center for Puerto Ricans living in Harlem. Grace was also one of the founders of Lincoln Hall, an institution primarily for youth training. Okay, this guy is not your average Joe, okay? This Joe is something else. He has powerful connections and undoubtedly Catholic. Now, this is from the Executive Intelligence Review Special Report of 1987. Quote, in 1907, Joseph P. Grace joined the board of the First National City Bank, then owned by Rockefeller Stillman Interest, and set up Grace National Bank in 1915. Joseph Grace became a member of the Interna American International Corp, founded principally by Frank Vanderlip of Citibank, which traded extensively with Russia before and after the Bolshevik Revolution. It was located at 120 Broadway, the office of a complex of firms representing every major Wall Street financial group involved in similar dealings. Now, this is from, this is interesting, James J. Zatko. This man, I believe, got his doctorate from uh, Notre Dame. He is from Catholic University, historian. Okay? And he even said this in his book, Descent into Darkness, page 111, with the following. And, uh, and he describes the Bolshevik Revolution, all right? An atmosphere of apparent good feeling having been established. Monsignor Pizardo met Vladimir Vorovsky uh, to define points of an accord between the Holy See, the, the Vatican, and Russia for a papal mission in Russia. Still, this informal meeting did not have any effect on the conference, and the only result was the accord for the papal relief mission. This accord provided for the work of three Catholic orders in Russia. Uh, the Redemptorists to work in northern Russia, the Society of Jesus, Jesuits, to work in central Russia, and the Society of the Divine Word to work in southern Russia. Now, Avro Manhattan will confirm it. It's crazy. Right after the Bolshevik Revolution, the Vatican sent in a bunch of their Catholics over there to work alongside with the government. Mm -hmm. Why? To get many Catholic converts. Now that's strange, isn't it? But I'll show you Abra Manhattan stuff later, okay? Now Zatko continues with this. This is weird. In the communist strategy, Catholic propaganda was to cause a whole orthodox structure to crumble. See? Told you so. This is from Zatko, okay? So they are against the Orthodox Church. The instruments of this new alliance between the Soviets and the Vatican were to be the Jesuits, described as the enemies of the Orthodox Church. Reportedly, there were and had been for a considerable time large numbers of representatives of the Jesuit order in Moscow including Bishop Ropp, the Pope, who is said to have left the Jesuit order before being elected Pope, acted entirely on the instructions of Count, I'm going to butcher names again, Count Letochowski, the Superior General of the Jesuit order. According to the same report, the Vatican felt it could bring the Russian church under papal domination only if Tikhon, who is a patriarch, Patriarch, supposedly, of the R Russian Orthodox Church, I believe. If Tikhon were eliminated, a condition which the Bolsheviks thought had been fulfilled. Well, then what happened? Unless Rivera's statement story matched up and, co and corroborated with that. The Jesuits and the Vatican, on their part, promised that after a conclusion of a concordat, that they would do all in their power to put pressure on the governments of Italy, France, and Belgium to hasten their recognition of the Soviet government. How about that? I th yeah, I think there was something fishy going on. To say there was no Catholic involvement, you're very blind. This is from Edmund Paris himself, okay, the guy whose work I highly recommended. He even admitted this, quote, The Russian Revolution, by eliminating the Tsar, protector of the Orthodox Church, had it not decapitated the great rival and helped the penetration of the Roman Church? We must strike while the iron is hot. 
the famous Russicum, Russicum is, uh, which is, I think, a Russian college in Rome, is created, and its clandestine missionaries will take the good news to this schismatic country. One century after their expulsion by Tsar Alexander I, the Jesuits will again undertake the conquest of the Slav world. All right, that's from Edmund Paris himself. Let's see right here. This is admitted by Anthony uh, Sutton himself in his book, Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution. So he believes the bankers were responsible. You, you know what he said? The American International Court, uh, let's see right here, la la la, was organized in New York on November 22, 1915 by the J.P. Morgan Interests with major participation by Stillman's National City Bank and the Rockefeller Interests. Every co everybody coveted the AIC stock. Joe Grace! This guy wanted $600,000 in addition to his interest in National City Bank. In 1917, the Grace Russian Company was formed. What in the world, man? <laughs> the joint owners being W.R. Grace and Company and the San, San Galli Trading Company of Petrograd, uh, Petrograd, American International Corp, and a substantial investment in the Grace Russian Company uh, with an interlocking directorship. As the Bolshevik Revolution took hold in central Russia, Secretary of State Robert Lansing requested the views of American International Corp on the policy to be pursued towards the Soviet regime on January 16, 1918, barely two months after the takeover in Petrograd and Moscow, and before a fraction of Russia had come under Bolshevik control, William Franklin Sands, Executive Secretary of American International Corp, submitted this requested memorandum on the Russian political situation to Secretary Lansing. In brief, Sands, as executive secretary of a corporation whose directors were the most prestigious in, on Wall Street, provided an emphatic endorsement of the Bolsheviks and the Bolshevik Revolution, and within a matter of weeks after the revolution started, and as a director of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, Sands had just contributed one million dollar to the Bolsheviks. All right, so we see right here that this is not as innocent as you think, that there are players behind the scenes more and more. We can see players behind the scenes. Here's, let's see right here, Avro Manhattan, okay? So I'll read just a, some, some small portions from Vatican Against World Politics, page 334. This is from Count Sorva, who was in close contact with the Vatican. He said this, At the Vatican, Bolshevism was at the beginning viewed as a horrible evil undoubtedly, but also as a necessary evil, which might possibly have salutary consequences. The structure of the Ro Russian church would never have given way so long as Tsarism lasted, so the Tsar. Mm -hmm. Among the ruins accumulated by Bolshevism, there was room for everything, even for a religious revival in which the influence of the Roman church might have made itself felt. Mm -hmm. End of quote by Count Sorba, uh, Sforza, if I'm pronouncing his name right. So Manhattan writes, immediately after the First World War, the Vatican entered into contact with the Bolsheviks. Why would you do that as soon as communism takes over? Why would you do that? Unless they already had players there before, contacts there before, or plans before. Okay? But anyway, food for thought. 
with the object of reaching an agreement allowing Catholic activities in the new Russia. This was done while simultaneously the Catholic Church was fulminating against the ideology and the acts of terrorism promoted by Bolshevism throughout Europe, including Russia herself. But although the Catholic Church was condemning Bolshevism wherever found, it refrained from such condemnation during negotiations with the Soviet Republic. You know what that is? That is a snake. That is no new news. The Catholic Church has always done that. Playing all sides. That's how you become powerful. Why? Just, because, just in case one team becomes a loser and the other team becomes a winner. Let's see right here. It tolerated and even negotiated with Bolshevism in order to destroy that great religious enemy, the Orthodox Church. Or rather, after the revolution, to supplant it permanently. These diplomatic, political, and religious machinations reached the climax as far as concerns the Catholic Church in 1922 during the Conference of Genoa. At a dinner, the Bolshevik Minister for Foreign Affairs, Chicharin, and the Archbishop of Genoa toasted each other. They had been discussing the future relationship of the Vatican and Soviet Russia. Chicharin emphasized that any religion had ample scope in Russia since the Soviet Republic had separated church and state. But when the Vatican later proposed concrete plans for Catholicizing Russia, it incurred great difficulties. Mormon Orthodox Church was Mormon indeed, but it was not yet dead. The Vatican next approached the various nations and having representatives at Genoa and sent a papal messenger bearing a letter from the Secretary of, St of State. This missive asked the powers not to sign any treaty with Russia unless freedom to practice any religion was guaranteed by it, together with the restoration of all church property. Okay, so tensions are rising. At the beginning, they're trying to work out something, but, uh, but those communists are not really following through. Alberto Rivera from the Godfather comics believed communism was born because of the Jesuits, but then that daughter betrayed the Vatican. Yeah. So that's why they've been enemies since. But that's what uh, Alberto Rivera claimed. Here's something that's interesting is that... Uh, Meanwhile, other events had occurred in the international field. A strong government and a new political social ideology created as a claim to fight Bolshevism at home and abroad had arisen in, guess where? Italy. The movement was called fascism. Benito Mussolini. We have already seen how the Catholic Church quickly realized that this movement would be useful in her, uh, to her in fighting socialism and Bolshevism, and from the beginning supported it, foreseeing amongst other things that the significance of fascism would not be confined to the internal policy of Italy. It soon became clear that international repercussions would follow and its economic and social ideology would counterbalance the ideology of Bolshevism. This above all in view of the fact that powerful elements throughout the world were, uh, throughout the world, to, uh, they were upset with the new Russia and that such hostility was increasing with the passing of the years. Thus the Vatican, instead of listening to the numerous overtures of the Soviet Republic, developed another plan. What did they do? They were planning and they were going to this time side with Benito Mussolini, Italy. Why? Because he fulfilled the request that they wanted him to do. All right, but anyway, before I continue onward, that's a whole nother story. We're, we're rushing ahead. We're rushing ahead. So let's see what the Vatican will do and then World War II pops out and don't forget Germany is suffering. Before we go over there, let's not go too fast. Let's go to USA. It's crumbling in pieces. Dr. Ruckman uh, writes in his Church History Volume 2, page 346, uh, several important significant factors how the world or the United States itself, which was used to be a godly nation, founded on Baptist uh, distinctive, where it now became... Uh, 
uh, uh, paving the way of worshiping the Antichrist. One was, we already know Abraham Lincoln. He really did that bad job where everything now became uh, one country under the United States. So now more federal control, right? So the states cannot have their own sovereignty pretty much. Then, if uh, Lil Evan leaveneth the whole, whole lump, what do you think is going to happen to the money? So then, what happened with the money is Franklin Roosevelt, FDR himself. This is not a good guy. If you've been told he was a good guy in your public schools, remember this. Public school is always wrong, all right? Whenever they say someone's a good guy, think of the opposite, and you're 90% of the right, right. Amen. And someone they thought was a bad guy, you'd be surprised 90% of the time, you'd be right that they were wrong about that. You might be surprised, okay? So, Franklin Roosevelt, Dr. Ottman blamed him about he had prohibition repealed, producing a nation of drunks, and then took gold by force from the people and replaced it with silver certificates worth about half the gold. Mm -hmm. So that's why our economy, you wonder why we're falling apart and we're borrowing, borrowing, and then printing out, printing out. Where did they get all this dough from, man? And now we, we can't, I guess what, we're running out of paper and we got to save the environment so we got to go digital? You know, one the world, you know? So I jest, obviously, I'm being sarcastic, but the point is, notice how bad our economy is falling apart. All began where? Once they rejected that word of God, then the elites got into play, and then the, the entire economy is falling apart, you know. That's what's going on. Okay, so, when FDR came to the scene, and then the gold standard got lost, should, uh, do we see Vatican hands behind this? Look here. You, you remember JFK who got assassinated? Mm -hmm. Who was a Catholic? His daddy. He was, believe it or not, Knights of Malta. His dad was part of Knights of Malta. As a matter of, uh, as a matter of fact, you can still look it up. I don't know if they'll still, do, still have it up, but Wikipedia, if you look up Knights of Malta, they'll have a bunch of names. They put Benito Mussolini there and uh, also Joseph P. Kennedy. So I don't know if it'll still get on there. <laughs> we don't know how long. FDR son-in-law, Curtis Dahl, you know what he claimed? This is him himself, Curtis Dahl, FDR's son-in-law. In his book, he wrote, uh, let's see right here, FDR, my exploited father-in-law, page 119 and 120. This is what he said. When the, remember, the Great Depression occurred, okay, so after World War I, some of you heard about the historical timeline of the Roaring Twenties and then, you know, what happened after that, then the Great Depression. So, supposedly, there were bankers behind the scenes that had manipulated and done stuff behind it. And then you're going to see Catholic powers behind it again. So, Curtis Dahl claimed this. He wrote, the feeling around the street, I'm assuming it's, he's talking about Wall Street. The feeling around the street, because he has it capitalized, in succeeding months was that there were, in particular, three large short sellers of stock. Allegedly, Tom Bragg, Ben Smith, and Joe Kennedy. Of the three mentioned well-known uh, well short sellers, Joe Kennedy was allegedly the most important, the most powerful, and the most successful. And you wonder how his son became president of the United States. If you look at uh, his son's life, he wasn't as successful in academics as you would, as you would think. This service made him invaluable. Was Joe Kennedy carefully selected by world money leaders to sell short? <laughs> That's what FDR's son-in-law said. That's kind of strange, isn't it? Very strange. Here's from uh, Louis T. McFadden. He's chairman of the House Committee on Banking and Cur Currency. Uh, addressed the House of Representatives on June 10th, 1932. This is what he says. Mr. Chairman, we have been dealing with the effect of things rather than with the cause of things. We have in this country one of the most corrupt institutions the world has ever known. 
uh, he, uh, let's see, did I mention he addressed the House of Representatives on June 10th, 1932? Okay, this is what he said. He's chairman of the House Committee on Banking and Currency. He says, I refer to the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks. He claims they're the most corrupt institutions in the world has ever known. The iniquities of the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks acting together have cost this country enough money to pay the national debt several times over. This evil institution has impoverished and ruined the people of the United States. It has done this through the corrupt practices of the money vultures who control it. The Federal Reserve Banks are private credit monopolies which prey upon the people of the United States for the benefit of themselves. The Wilson administration, under the tutelage of those sinister Wall Street figures, oh, see, even the president was controlled, which was, we already learned, who stood behind Colonel House, established here in our free country the worm-eaten monarchical institution of the King's Bank to control us from the cradle to the grave. In other words, the imperial power of elasticity of the public currency is wielded exclusively by the central corporations owned by the banks. Why should our national bank depositors and our government be forced to finance the, muni the munition factories of Germany and Soviet Russia? That's what he said, okay? He said, uh, he, he said this from the House Committee on Banking and Currency. This is big stuff. The United States has been ransacked and pillaged. Our structure has been gutted and only the walls are left standing. This is the John Law swindle over again. The theft of Teapot Dome was tr trifling compared to compared to it. What king ever robbed his subjects to such an extent as the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks have robbed us? Let's see right here. Every effort has been made by the Federal Reserve Board to conceal its power, but the truth is the Federal Reserve Board has usurped the government of the United States. It controls everything here and it controls all our foreign relations. Money, money, see banks, banks, money, 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 money. It makes and breaks governments at will. When the Federal Reserve Act was passed, the people of the United States did not perceive that a world system was being set up here, which would make the savings of an American school teacher available to a narcotic drug vendor in Macau. They did not perceive that the United States was to be lowered to the position of a coolie country which has nothing but raw materials and heavy goods for export, that Russia was destined to supply manpower, and that this country was to supply financial power to an international super state. A super state controlled by international bankers and international industrialists acting together to enslave the world. This is from the chairman of the House Committee on Banking and Currency, Louis T. McFadden himself. Huh. Smell a rat, right? Smell a rat. Strange stuff. A lot of strange stuff going on here. Okay, I'm going to read uh, something from Frederick Whittleson that he gives that's pretty eye-opening about how the world fell apart through its currency. Very in he has very interesting stuff and his own theories. Um, but this is way too many pages, so I don't think I'm going to read all of it. But he has some very interesting... Uh, he has some very interesting historical points here. I would recommend uh, for people to read that if they want to learn more about it. But he has a section called America's Economy and Foreign Policy on page 356 to 358. But he pointed out about the Great Depression and then a lot of the, the foreign policy that's very, very interesting. The key point that he's talking about, though, is how our United States fell apart because they were trying to become more global. All right, like a globalist. Yeah. See, that's the idea. One world. Instead of letting the nations mind their own business. But instead, they always get involved. They always get involved. And because of that, he believes that that's the reason why that uh, the communists were able to take over. Because of what happened between Japan and China. 
that FDR made a really dumb decision on that one. But anyway, that's a whole different story. Uh, I don't necessarily agree 100% of what he says, but basically the bottom line of what he says I agree is when, you, when this, uh, like I told you, the independence is gone. See that? And when you become all more federal, or meaning one world, right? One, one, one controlling all more, that's eventually leading to what? One ruler, Antichrist, who gets the whole pot. Right. So we Bible believers, what we learn from history, this is a historical fact, success is found when the Christians have always separated themselves. Yeah. But why are Christians doing ecumenical movements? Yeah. They're not separating. Separation is so important. Amen. Can't just think that we're all in the same crown. No, we have to separate ourselves for pure doctrine, pure truth. Uh, caving into the ecumenical movement is caving is giving up right doctrine. Caving it, tolerating wrong stuff, wrong stuff, wrong stuff, more and more and more and more and more. Then you need leaders to control it because it's too big. It's really bad. That's our Baptist distinctive: separation of church and state. Amen. That's why we're an independent Baptist church. We're not just a Baptist church. The Southern Baptist church, they have their own convention. We don't like that. We're independent Baptist. Amen. So in other words, I'm a local independent Baptist church pastor. I, I cannot control some other independent Baptist church over there. We have no pope. We have no pope. We don't believe in that. Kind of like states, right? Okay, so they have their own leaders. They have their own group. Get out of here. Mind your own business. We don't want you. Amen. Oh, but no, let's l flood them all in. And Thomas Jefferson was uh, complaining about that. He was upset about that. If you read, I think, Edmund Paris's book, it's interesting how him and I think John Adams were complaining about how the Jesuits were now able to take control with a lot of the Catholic immigrants coming in now. It changed the demographics of everything. You see this? What men learn from history is that men never learn from history, do they? You teach it. If Basically, what I'm telling you this, what our government and our schools and our society is doing, if they keep pushing these practices, these policies, you wonder why the whole world is falling apart. What we learn from history is that separation is what helped us become better. Amen. Separation. And that's a biblical concept as well. Biblical concept. Now, do we believe in unity? Of course, we don't believe in being divisive. Yeah. Okay? There's a difference with being uh, divisive and uh, separation. All right? Separation from something unclean. All right? There shouldn't be division with the clean. That's the idea. Okay. Anyway, I yacked long enough. Now, here are some things that are interesting about uh, World War II. This is what uh, Rivera said. At the end of World War I, when the Allies signed the Treaty of Versailles in July 1919, they were so mad at the Vatican for starting the war that they refused to recognize them as a political power anymore and kept them away from the conference table. Didn't you know that? This is actually uh, documented by Edmund Paris's book, Secret History of the Jesuits. Why? Because they know. Like, no one's a fool. No government leader's a fool. They knew the Vatican had something to do with it. Okay. Even though Europe was in shambles, neither France was broken, nor was the Orthodox Church in Serbia, young people in Germany and Italy didn't know which way to turn. They were rebellious. Inflation was running, ruining the country. Communists were organizing revolutionary groups. The Jesuits moved on three fronts. Now... They can move, okay? This World War II would have never happened, all right, had it not been for these guys, how they moved, and because of what the stupid Americans did, according to Frederick Widdowson's book, A Bible Believer's Guide to World History, that I told you about those page numbers. World War II wouldn't have even happened because of the Americans' stupid mistakes. No one was, you gotta realize, after World War I, people weren't content or satisfied with the peace treaty terms, all right? It didn't satisfy everybody. Why? Because bankers were behind it, setting the terms. You wonder why they did that. Could it be that they wanted another war to happen? See? That's something to think about. A lot of things to think about. Here we go now. So, 
The Jesuits now are on the move, beginning World War II. The first front was Italy. At this time, an unknown man appeared, strutting around, saying he was the new Caesar, destined to rebuild the Roman Empire. Sounds antichrist, doesn't he? Yeah. His name was Benito Mussolini. And yes, even Wikipedia shows he's Knights of Malta from the category. It's crazy. He was arrogant, ruthless, and vicious. His little army of black shirts were nothing more than a group of thugs beating all opponents into submission. The black pope assigned a top Jesuit to work with Mussolini. His priest and father confessor was a Jesuit named Venturi. The Catholic vote directed by the Vatican swept Mussolini into power. Pius XI, Pope Pius XI, called Mussolini the man whom providence allowed us to meet. All by uh, Edmund Paris's book. They're documented mostly in Edmund Paris's book, even though I'm reading from Godfathers. To pay off the Vatican, Mussolini signed a concordat making Roman Catholicism the only religion allowed in Italy and its territories. Mussolini reestablished the temporal power of the Pope and gave the clergy complete power over the life of the nation. Italy became a major power under their Catholic fascist dictator Mussolini. He built a powerful modern army and flexed his muscles by attacking Ethiopia. Italy needed more land. The poor, bewildered Ethiopians didn't have a chance. They fought valiantly with their spears and shields, but Mussolini's air force cut them to shreds with machine guns, bombs, and poison gas. The Pope had blessed Mussolini's troops, and Cardinal Archbishop of Milan, Alfredo uh, Il Delfonso Schuster, called, uh, who's a Jesuit supposedly, called this massacre of the blacks in Ethiopia, quote, a Catholic crusade. But look at the history, secret history of Jesuits by Edmund Paris, all right? His is loaded with documentations about what happened in World War II. By 1923, Germany was in a mess. Inflation was sky high and money was worthless. The German people were sick of war with all its death and misery. They blamed the Kaiser for the whole thing and had him and his government thrown out of office. The communists were fighting to take over. This is bad, all right? So Germany's in trouble because of Russia, the communists, how uh, they took over Russia. Now they're afraid they might happen to them. And you might recall the Cold War, Germany was split in half. See, they're scared of the communists. They need a savior. They need a leader. What men learn from history is that men never learn from history. What do you see right now? Even Christians, they're seeking that savior. The new government was very weak. Some men wanted the German people to run their own government like they did in France and were attempting to make Germany a republic. The Pope was outraged. The republic was doomed to failure. Two things that the Vatican despises are Protestantism and democracy. The Jesuits moved, quickly moved to stop this new Weimar Republic. Uh, two men destroyed it. One was Franz von Papen. The other was Pacelli, who later became Pope Pius XII. The stage was being set for Germany's new Roman Catholic star. His name was Hitler. Hitler. Adolf Hitler. We will stop right here. Well, All right. I won't be, and I, I don't think I can continue the story until two or three Wednesdays later, okay? So buckle your seatbelts. It's going to get wild. I cannot, the most documentations on conspiracies of Catholicism is not all that I read to you. It's World War II, and I cannot read all of that. Frederick Widdowson goes two chapters on that one. <laughs> Edmund Paris's book mostly is on World War II on that one. I'm going to try to do it at one, but this is wild. Here we go. Yeah. Father God, dismiss us now with your blessing. I pray that we've learned from our history, Lord, and that we can see what's going on, the players and the people being played and where we're at today as Bible believers. We can see how the devil took over this world, why Christian churches have lost their zeal, why Christians have apostatized because of the lack of godly preaching that could have saved many people, to stand for the King James Bible and right doctrine. I pray that we will learn our lessons from this history. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.